determined immediately. This is amazing. The worst start for a Grand Prix that I have ever seen in the whole of my life. He's out of the race. He's out of the race. Oh, my goodness. This is fantastic. And I've got to stop because I'm going to love it, my friend. Hello everyone and welcome to Maximum Downforce, your official Downforce Radio Formula One podcast and my name is Will Knight. Joining me in today's episode is Jake Sanson and Topher Smith. Jake, Topher, it was a fantastic Grand Prix, the season opener in Bahrain. Jake, we start with you and then we'll move on to uh, to Topher. What were your thoughts on the Grand Prix? I thought it was a really good way to start the season actually. Um, We needed a good race do kickstart 2021 I think to give people a little bit of hope for the season that we were in for a decent battle we've kind of been building up to the Lewis Hamilton versus Max Verstappen story for a while and I was kind of hoping that this was going to be the year we'd finally see it and it genuinely looks like we've got that Uh, I think Max and Lewis are going to be very evenly matched over the season Ferrari have clearly got better McLaren look reasonably competitive and it's definitely looking like all round we could have a better year in 2021 and Tofa, if you were to pinpoint your favourite moment of the weekend, what would it be? Uh, see, it was a little bit of a, a bittersweet Grand Prix for me, actually, because we had this fantastic battle on track and we went into the weekend thinking, oh, maybe we can finally see a proper fight from Red Bull and from Max Verstappen. And I was thinking maybe just for once we will have someone other than Mercedes winning the season opener. And I will admit, there was a little bit of an element of disappointment uh, in the fact that Hamilton still went and won the season open. It was still a Mercedes victory. But having said that, I can't deny that he actually did deserve to win that Grand Prix. Verstappen was the favourite across the entire course of the weekend and pre-season testing as well. And yeah, in the end, Hamilton just simply out him. Verstappen did make mistakes, but those were mistakes that came under pressure from the brilliance of Lewis Hamilton. And I'm like I said, it's a little bit bittersweet because I feel as though we were in for um, we were in for having another challenger. So maybe someone else could win a season opener for once. But at the same time, I feel as though we are set up for an absolutely incredible season this year. Now, like you just mentioned, it was Lewis Hamilton who took his first win of the season, his 96th overall I think we're definitely going to see him break that 100 mark this year if all goes to plan for Mercedes but overall Jake it was actually quite a controversial win in terms of the way he went about it he went wide at turn four 29 times Mm. causing let's just say outrage from the Verstappen fan base quite a lot of Formula One fans asking what's the point in having track limits if you're not going to enforce them but when looking at the rule book what he did was perfectly legal do you think there are some loopholes or grey areas which the FIA needs to stamp out or is it just that spark of competition which we're seeing there? I think ultimately it's the first one I think if there's going to be a rule in force then it needs to be done consistently and I think essentially the powers that be now need to define what they mean by track limits exemption you know is running offline 29 times flat out on the throttle gaining you time or is it just not applied unless you're overtaking somebody and that I guess is where the clarification needs to come from if we can clarify whether Lewis Hamilton running wide that number of times actually gained him time or whether the rule is only to be applied for an overtake then I guess that's where the clarity comes from I can see why the powers that be gave Max Verstappen the penalty. And it is unfortunate because Max actually did a really good job in getting past him, but it did sort of unsettle his rhythm. And that's where we kind of had the battle of the ages fizzle out. And it's, it's disappointing for the fans because I think, you know, we're at a stage where a great motor racing overtake is kind of sullied by a regulation, which is no longer there. If this was an overtake that had taken place in the 80s, for example, he would have gone on to the grass to make the overtaking move. And I think everybody would have lauded it as one of the craziest overtaking moves of all time. But we have to look at it from the context of where Formula One is now. It's disappointing because it did affect the result. We did miss a a fantastic overtaking move and it did get spoiled. But at the same time, you can't take away from the fact that both drivers deserve the win. Both drivers fought 110% to go get it. And whichever one of them had been the winner, it would have been deserved. Now, when we actually look at the fact that he did go off circuit 29 times, as counted by uh, Tom Coronel, I saw a video on Instagram, him him posting something up there. And Christian Horner said that that was worth around 0.2 seconds every time Lewis Hamilton went off circuit. 
if we add that up, do a bit of maths, which obviously Formula One sees a lot of, that is 5.8 seconds. Topher, does that mean that Hamilton, if let's just say you were in the position of the stewards in that Grand Prix weekend, would you give Hamilton a five second penalty in terms of he did go off track mul- multiple times and to some extent he did gain an advantage? Hamilton, uh, Verstappen was only eight tenths behind him come the uh, finish of the race. If you were in that position, what would you do? See, me personally, if I was the uh, steward that weekend, I absolutely would have been giving him a penalty for that. And that's just simply because I have a very, um, a very black and white thinking behind the whole track limits idea. The white line is the white line. Mm. If you take the example of a football match, for example, you don't have the referee saying, yeah, so the ball's out of play if it goes behind the white line. But, oh, that particular section of the pitch over there, if it goes behind the white line just a little <laughs> bit, that's absolutely fine. You don't need to worry about that. No, you don't see that in football. So why do we have this situation in Formula One where they go off track multiple times, pass a white line, he did it 29 times as calculated, and they say, ah, oh, no, nah, it's fine, it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, I don't get the thinking behind it. They put the white lines down onto the circuit for a reason, and that is to define the racing circuit. And if the drivers are going to be taking liberties by extending that, trying to gain time, in this case 5.8 seconds over the course of the Grand Prix, I just think, well, that's just taking the mickey a bit with what has been defined as the racing circuit. And for me personally, I think that what the stewards need to do is they need to apply the same rule to each and every circuit in saying that the white line is the white line, no excuses. If a driver is forced off the track by another driver, that's fine. You've been forced off. You've got got nowhere to go. Like, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. But if you're repeatedly running wide and extending the track like Lewis Hamilton is doing, I think the leniency needs to be three times and you get a penalty because you might run wide just because you get it wrong. Like you might just run a bit wide, miss the apex, get some understeer or whatever. But if you do it multiple times, and as I say, I think it should be three times, you should get a penalty. Like the three strikes and you're out sort of rule. Mm. I, I just feel as though it's one of those rules where the drivers are taking so many liberties and just pushing what they can get away with. And part of me feels so that Lewis Hamilton was in some way pushing that limit himself. He knew that he was allowed to run wide at turn four and he's making the most of that, which he will do. He's a racing driver, but it just makes a bit of a mockery of the whole track limits idea, in my opinion. And there was a whole situation where uh, Max Verstappen ran wide out of turn four and went around Lewis Hamilton to take the lead. In that situation, he is off the racing line. I mean, so he's off the track. He's past the white line, taking a position. He did the right thing, giving the place back there. I've got no arguments against that. But when lap after lap, you are repeatedly running wide, extending the track limits, going over the white line, I just think that we need to do the same as what they do in football. If the ball goes all the way over the white line, it's out of play. That's my opinion. I think quite a lot of people will uh, will share your sentiments on that. I think you can agree as well, Jake. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the racing driver knows the racing driver knows ultimately that the race circuit is the black thing with the white lines on the other side of it. And the design of the modern Formula One circuit is where this track limits issue has come in in the nineties and in the eighties when you know Formula One was a lot more black and white to a certain extent. You ran offline, you went onto the grass, you spun the car, you hit the barrier, your race was over. And we have so many liberties now that, as Topher mentioned, you know, the drivers can take because of the runoff area. But at the same time, you know, I don't see any reason why we can't have grass next to the circuit. I don't see why we need these massive runoff areas. They say it's safety. Well, yes, but the cars are so much safer now than they ever used to be. Uh, I've always been of the opinion that the circuits were a little unsafe, obviously, in the 80s and 90s, but there was nothing wrong with having grass on the outside of the circuit or gravel even on the outside of the circuit. Yes, the cars rolled, but nine times out of 10, if a car rolled in Formula One, the driver would get out uninjured. So I don't really see that as being a decent argument. I think the runoff area gives racing drivers a get out of jail free card every time. There should be grass on the outside. There should be gravel on the outside. If a driver makes a mistake, it should be a penalty, whether that's to do with a penalty from the officials if they gain an advantage from it, or you know you make a mistake, it costs you your race. 
that's what a racing driver goes through. You, it, it happens that way in karting. There's no runoff areas in karting. There's no runoff areas in the British Touring Car Championship. You go off, you go off. It's the end of the story. One thing I'd like to the to uh, add to the whole thing of the runoff areas, mm. if it's down to me, this is what I would do, the runoff areas. I would have the uh, the normal curbing on the outside of the corner where the cars can run onto perfectly fine. Then after that, have a metre or two of grass where if they run too wide, the grass can throw them into a spin or just at least slow them down if they're able to catch it. Then after the grass, have a bit of a tarmac runoff area where if they go even further wide, they'll still lose time by going that far wide, but then they'll have that sort of area where they can slow the car down without risk of rolling. But then after that, before the barriers, then you have some gravel. If they go really off, they've got the time to slow down on the tarmac, but then by the time they've reached the gravel, they have then go in at a slower speed where the gravel will catch them and bring the car to a stop, but it would dramatically reduce the risk of a barrel roll if the gravel is that far out. Mm. So you've got the grass, which can punish the minor mistake and make them lose time. The runoff area where they can slow the car down before reaching the gravel to lessen the uh, dramatic impact of a barrel roll, and then the gravel to actually catch the car if they make that much of a mistake. That's my yeah. idea on that. Brilliant idea. And as we take a look at your results, as we have mentioned thoroughly, it was Lewis Hamilton's 96th race win in Formula One, followed by Max Verstappen. Valtteri Bottas stayed well clear of his rivals to finish third place. A 10.9 second pit stop certainly didn't help in that. Lando Norris finished fourth with Perez in fifth on his Red Bull debut. Charles Leclerc finished sixth. Daniel Ricciardo seventh. Carlos Sainz taking his first points for Ferrari in eighth. Yuki Tsunoda became the first Japanese driver in history to score points on his debut with Lance Stroll taking Aston Martin's sole point in the 2021 championship so far. Now, gentlemen, we've talked enough about Mercedes. Let's move on to their Austrian rivals at Red Bull. Simple question, Jake. Red Bull, strategy mistake, driver mistake. What's your opinion? It's a very difficult one because the lines are very blurry on this one. I wouldn't say it was a strategy mistake. I just think they went with what was conventional. Uh, Mercedes kind of hoodwinked them a little bit which obviously is not really Red Bull's failing. I think it's hard to say that it was a um, driver mistake with Max Verstappen either because he pushed tooth and nail. You've got to remember that the the dirty air at Bahrain in particular is a big punisher on drivers chasing each other. It's not the greatest race circuit for overtakes because the dirty air punishes you so much with the changes of camber, with the uh, high ambient temperature, with the fact that it's very dusty. It's not the greatest race circuit in the world for overtakes. So I wouldn't say it was either, in all honesty. I think it was just the way that the race played out. One thing I will say is that it's great to see Red Bull coming out of the blocks, fighting right from the start. They've had a bit of a reputation over the last few years of stumbling out of the blocks, and it takes two or three races for them to get going, by which point the momentum's already gone. But they really have come out of the blocks with a good car, with a good setup. They've learned a lot from Abu Dhabi last year when they completely caned Mercedes. They found a lot of advantages in their uh, in their stable to a certain extent, and they found weaknesses in the Mercedes game plan. So I really hope this is the year they really start to challenge. And if they win the title this year, I genuinely think of all of their five world titles, if they were to win it, it will be their best. And Tofa. The other side of the garage had a bit of a difficult weekend in terms of Sergio Perez's Red Bull debut. He qualified 11th in qualifying, not even reaching Q3. That was ultimately because of a Red Bull strategy mistake. They put him on the medium tyres because they thought he could go out and set a better lap time. And he just got out outpaced on the soft runners at the end of the day. Ferrari had a 1-2 in Q2. We haven't seen that in a very long time, possibly. Ooh, 2019, last time we saw that. Mm. Either way... His car failed. He control alt deleted it on the formation lap, started from the pits and finished fifth. At the end of the day, although it's not what Red Bull would have hoped, they've certainly got a good driver in Sergio Perez now. Now, one thing to point out there, they weren't actually the only team that got caught out by that tie gamble. Uh, Yuki Tsunoda with the Alpha Tauri, uh, he was second fastest in Q1 and then thought that they had the speed to get into Q3 through Q2 on the mediums. But that ultimately caught them out and Yuki qualifying in 13th yeah. place. It just shows the difference in the tyres around the Bahrain circuit. But um, going back to what you were asking about Sergio, I think, yes, it was a mistake by the team to put him onto the mediums in Q2. You can understand their thinking about it because they did have the dominant car up until that point, especially in the hands of Max Verstappen. So 
I, I think even if I was them, I would have been thinking mediums looks like a good shout for Q2 here, but yeah, he just couldn't get speed out of the tyre. And as I said, it wasn't just Perez, it was Sonoda as well. But Perez turning it around the way that he did, going from having to control alt delete his car off the final corner back into the pit lane and then surging through into fifth position is reminiscent of how he won the Sakir Grand Prix last year when he was punted off at turn three by Charles Leclerc and then came back from the back of the field to win their race. Um, it was a little bit of a, in some ways, a bit of a sucker punch, I think, from Sergio Perez in that uh, the early parts of the weekend, we were thinking, oh, Perez, has is he really that good? He's up against Max Verstappen. Like, Is he going to struggle against him? And up until that point uh, on the formation lap, people thinking, oh, Perez is really going to struggle here. He might not get any points. Is he even going to start the race? But then he goes from a pit lane start to fifth place. And that is Sergio Perez saying, look, I do have the talent. I know what I'm doing. You give me a good car. I'm going to do the job on track. That is exactly what he needed to do to show not just Red Bull, but to show the entire Formula One community that he was the right person to put into that car alongside Max Verstappen. And there are a lot of people thinking maybe they should have kept on Alex Albon, should they have signed Nico Hülkenberg, maybe gone some other direction. But no, I think Sergio Perez at that particular moment in time was absolutely the right call for Red Bull to sign. And his performance in Saki, going from pit lane to fifth, that just backs up their thinking. And I applaud him for that. I think he's going to be in for a tremendous season. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got to remember that the reason that Red Bull went for him in the first place is that, you know, they're trying to win a constructors championship. They're not just trying to win a driver's championship. You need two guys who can be at their A game every time. And yeah, this race was kind of squandered for Perez before it even started. But to fight back to fifth position, I mean, the guy's just an absolute machine. And that's what Red Bull needs. They need two reliable drivers in the car. I'm not saying Albon wasn't, but to put all of that responsibility on a second year driver it was too much. You know, they did what they always do. They just put too much intensity, too much pressure, too much magnitude on a young driver that's still learning. They chewed him up and they spat him out and they needed to go with someone who could hack it. And he didn't have the pressure of, well, I have to deliver, otherwise my career is over because Sergio has already proven what he can do. Sergio doesn't really have the problem of, can I win a Grand Prix? He's already done it. He, everybody knows how good he is. So he can actually go out there and enjoy himself and give Red Bull the Constructors' Championship they need. One thing that I really hope for with uh, this new relationship between Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez, as you mentioned, Jake, is now having two star drivers, two proven drivers in the car. But do you remember what happened last time Red Bull had that in their uh, <laughs> their two guys? Yeah, you know exactly what happened. They came to blows. Um, yeah. And... Yeah, I'm I'm not going to say that that's going to happen with Max and Sergio because, you know, I believe they both get along very well. Uh, you never know in this sport, really. And one thing that they've always had in the past with having one clear team leader in Max Verstappen and then the second driver of Pierre Gasly or Alex Albon or whoever, it's very clear that they're behind the leading driver there. And as a result, the second driver does um, it does lack somewhat. In the case with Sergio Perez, because he is a 10-year veteran of the sport and a proven Grand Prix winner, he's not going to sit down on that if they decide that they want to make Max Verstappen team leader. I think in some ways Verstappen will be the de facto leader because he's been at the team longer. But Perez has been around long enough to know that he needs to make the team work around both drivers, not just Max or not just Sergio. It needs to be both drivers. And if Sergio and Max can work together have that harmonious relationship that was maybe somewhat lacking in the days of Daniel Ricciardo, mm. then maybe they can fight for the championship. I think they're in the best position they've been since 2013 to fight for the championship. They took four doubles in a row from 2010 to 2013. They had a bit of a... Well, they've had a few wins here and there in the meantime, but they've never really mounted a serious title challenge. This season, as I said, I reckon it's their best chance yet, and I think they'd be stupid if they're going to let, let that go by favouring one driver over the other. Now, we look back in history, a bit of a, uh, a move on in, in subject in terms of rewinding the clocks. Hunt versus Lauda, Prost versus Senna, Hakkinen versus Schumacher, Massa versus Hamilton. Jake, can you connect the dots of what I'm trying to say here? I think you're trying to get towards the fact of Hamilton versus Verstappen is the next big battle. Well, actually, yes, but also... McLaren versus Ferrari. It's back. Ah. We saw 
Daniel Ricciardo, Lando Norris, and Carlos Sainz. But yes, I do agree with you in the fact that this is the next big fight. Anyway, nonetheless, Ferrari versus McLaren. It's an age-old battle, a battle mm. which has seen many controversies, many swear words thrown around and punches thrown. And mm. if you look at Hunt, um, uh, women chatted up. I'm not really sure, to, to be honest with you. But either way, <laughs> McLaren versus Ferrari is back. Leclerc versus Norris, Ricciardo versus Sainz. Or vice versa. What do you think? I'm delighted. Absolutely delighted. Last year, Ferrari looked a shadow of their former self. They looked like Delara in the 1990s, not Ferrari in the 2020. And it was just so disappointing. So now that they've completely rebuilt themselves from the ground up, do you know, they've taken a leaf out of McLaren's book, interestingly enough. And this is a, a comparison I made at the weekend and nobody had really twigged it until I mentioned it. But if you look back at McLaren a few seasons ago, they had Alonso on their team alongside Van Dorn. Now, Alonso was worth how much, you know, millions, millions and millions and millions per season. They were hemorrhaging money. They got rid of Alonso or Alonso walked, whichever story you want to believe. And they brought in Dines, who was worth a couple of million, and Norris, who was worth a quarter of a million. All that money they then invested back into the car. And you know what? The car's competitive again. Ferrari have done the same thing. Vettel was on a massive multi-million pound contract because he's a four times world champion. He could command that kind of salary. He walked because Ferrari told him there was no place for him in 2021. Who did they sign to replace him? Carlos Sainz, a guy who's not worth that much money, but is still a very handy racing driver. Ferrari have done exactly the same thing as McLaren did. They've realized there's no point spending multiple million pound contracts on a guy who's not going to be any faster than a guy who's worth two or three. And Ferrari have done exactly the same thing. And that's why they've been able to make a massive, significant change already in the 2021 card. Now, of course, it's not going to be a brilliant car this year. Again, I think they're still going to struggle to get a win out of it but they can put all of that saved money into the resource and development for 2022. And I think next year, Ferrari will be winning races and fighting for the championship again with Leclerc and Science. I genuinely can see it because they've done the sensible thing. They've realized there's no point spending masses of money on one particular driver because of their status when you could go for someone who's arguably a tenth of a second slower or faster per lap for a fraction of the money, McLaren have rebuilt themselves from doing that. Ferrari are going to do the same. This is completely why I agree with the idea of having a salary cap for the drivers. Yeah. As I don't believe that one driver is worth however many millions more than another. Because when it comes down to it, if you put all of those Formula One drivers in the exact same car, the exact same setup and all that, all of the field would probably be within about half a second of each other. Like maybe mm. like seven or eight tenths, but within a second easily if you had them all in the same car. Now, I don't believe that one driver is worth, let's say, 50 million for sake of argument, while another is worth only a quarter of a million, just like Lando Norris was. Mm. So what you mentioned, Jake, about McLaren and now Ferrari doing what might be called a sensible thing in taking a bit of a cheaper driver who still has that ability to run as close to the front as they can get, That that is an absolute, you know... It's a no-brainer. Like, why would you spend so much on one driver only to leave yourself short for the R and D of developing the car? Mm. If you're, if to me, you're talking about, let's say, Lewis Hamilton versus Lando Norris. Lewis Hamilton, he does have the proven career. He's the most successful driver of all time, but he commands a mega buck salary. So, if I had a team and I was looking, do I want Lewis Hamilton, or Lando Norris? Yes, I know Lewis Hamilton. He has a proven track record. He's clearly one of the greatest we've ever seen. There's no doubting that. But if I'm looking at him more as a business model, which is what, what a lot of the teams are doing, I would be looking more at Lando Norris in that he's cheap, he's young, and he's got speed. I genuinely believe that someone like Lando Norris could maybe be world champion one day. So do I want to invest in a driver who is already successful towards the end of their career and commanding many hundreds of millions of whatever? Or do I want a younger driver who I can invest in for a future at a fraction of the price, but still get the same results? I know mm. which one I'd be looking at. So if you were to compare it to, I don't know, a fairy tale, you'd rather be the once upon a time rather than a happily ever after, if that makes sense. You'd rather be the beginning Too right. rather than the end. Yeah, absolutely. Too right. I mean, probably the two most desirable drivers on the Formula One grid right now are Lando Norris and George Russell, because they're cheap and they have masses of potential. You know, there's no point investing in something that's ridiculous quantities of money that 
stop you from developing. You know, every Formula One team wants to go faster. If you're spending so much money on car development uh, over a driver, you're going to go faster. You know, there's no two roads about it. Mercedes actually had a real decision to make this year about whether they signed Hamilton or whether they signed Russell. You know, they've already won world titles. Russell proved that he could win races and actually be faster than Bottas, which is exactly the position they're in now with Hamilton. Why spend that ludicrous quantity of money on Hamilton when they could have taken a cost cut and gone with George Russell? It's a fascinating development. And I think it could be one of the key factors of this year, looking at how McLaren and Ferrari perform and get better. Mercedes may well decide to do the same thing before Hamilton decides to retire. It's fascinating. I'm great. I'm really glad to see McLaren and Ferrari are getting back to where they are and they've done it by thinking smart. I think that probably would have been the better comparison for me to make, actually, uh, Lewis Hamilton versus George Russell, because we Mm. do actually have that comparison from the uh, Sakir Grand Prix last season. George Russell very, very nearly put it on pole position, only just pipped to the post by Bottas. I think only by one hundredth of a second, if I remember correctly. It was yeah. very tight. 0.012, I think. The, 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 question, the question ultimately you've got to ask is, in that race, would Hamilton have done a better job than George Russell actually did? Well, It's hard to say yes, isn't it? It is hard to say yes. Well, I think the only thing that we can really say on that is, would George Russell have won the race? had it not been for the operational errors of Mercedes in the pit stops. Without a shadow of a doubt, yes. Without a shadow of a doubt. George Russell, I don't think, would have only won that race. He would have dominated yeah. that race. I mean, I'm not complaining too much because yeah. it was great to see Sergio Perez finally take his first Grand Prix victory. Hmm. But it just goes to back up both of our points in that you've got Lewis Hamilton, the proven winner, but also the mega bucks demander. And you've got George Russell, the up-and-comer, who's got the potential to be world champion at a fraction of the price. Mercedes, as you say, Jake, they've got a lot of thinking to do here. Do they want to keep on the seven times world champion and have that like um, have that megastar appeal, if you like? Or do they want to invest in the future and also mm. invest in a better car? Bring in George Russell for a fraction of the salary. You've got a driver who has already proven he can win races, but then you've also got the money to then put back into the, into the development of the car. Yeah. So can Ferrari and McLaren win races this year? I'm not sure Ferrari can. I think McLaren definitely can. But their race by race are not going to be too dissimilar in pace again, which is, as you mentioned at the start, Will, you know, this is the the battle between McLaren and Ferrari for supremacy in third place in the Constructors' Championship. And I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be one of the fights of the season. McLaren versus Ferrari is back. And yeah, I think we're going to be really intrigued with some of the battles we're going to get. One of uh, the predictions I made pre-season, actually, um, I predicted that both McLarens, both Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo, would win at least one race yep. each on merit. It's not in yep. a race of attrition or anything, purely on merit. I am still yep. sticking by that after the first race. Both Lando and Daniel will win races this year on merit. That is my prediction. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at McLaren in Monza last year, Carlos Sainz if the red flag hadn't have come out, would have won that Grand Prix. He was in second on merit and no one was catching him. But the people who we were really expecting to be fine for third, Jake, and I'm going to rewind your memory here when we were recording Round the Bend, the first episode, I said that Aston Martin was in good hands because they would win a championship in 2022 Mm -hmm. or 2023. Now, in the words of Topher Smith, I don't really want to be eating my hat right now because they came out of the books and they were terrible. And that has they that, were that opinion has absolutely aged well, terrible. Has it? It hasn't aged well. That opinion. <laughs> um, it's fascinating, isn't it? I think everybody kind of assumed that because the cars would be painted green, we'd have a massive corporate branding in Aston Martin. Everything would be rosy, and it just goes to show that you slap a better name on something and expect it to do better. You've got to do so much more hard work behind the scenes and. I guess that the you know the new era re- regular uh, previously the 2020 car from Mercedes uh, as far as we're led to believe or as far as the car but whether that's going to be what they'll be able to do moving forward is uh, it's, it remains to be seen interestingly what Aston Martin F1 appear to have done is the risk of what McLaren Ferrari and potentially what he could help us out massively it turns out it doesn't look like he can he's just going to have a very similar season to what he had in 2020 and I think what Ferrari rather said the latter stages of Gerhard Berger's career Wettel is a four-time world champion and he's only 34 
You know, he is still a relatively young lad. He's about the same age as I am, in fact. And it's disappointing that, you know, he's going to be what Aston Martin stance and not a lot of substance behind it. And that's a shame because Sebastian genuinely looks out of sorts. He looks like he's not settled. He hasn't looked settled since the Canadian Grand Prix. Well, I think with um with Aston Martin, there's a little bit of, um let's say, an unfair expectancy around the brand because yeah. Aston Martin, it is an iconic brand, not just in Great Britain, but across the world, people know the name Aston Martin. You know, they're associated with James Bond. There's the glamour, the sex appeal there behind Aston Martin and some of the Bond cars that have come out of those films. So when Aston Martin came back into Formula One, people thinking, ah, oh, it's Aston Martin. It's sexy. It's got to be quick. It's got to be up there. Uh, when they're on the back foot, people are thinking, oh, but but it's Aston Martin. They have to be up there. So immediately they're already disappointed by it. And I think that's a bit of an unfair expectancy to put onto Aston Martin. Did, did, didn't they say the same thing about Jaguar in 2000? I they think it was did, yes. the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the exact same argument. They were expecting a lot of, out of Jaguar when they joined. And to be fair to Jaguar, they did have their moments of brilliance. Um, Eddie yeah. Irvine got a couple of podiums for them. Uh, Mark Webber, um, I believe he put a third on the grid at the 2003 Brazilian Grand Prix. A fantastic yeah. performance by him. Probably could have got on the podium before his uh, rather violent wreck that day. Mm. But yeah, it's just that expectancy around Aston Martin. And a team is not going to be great overnight. They took over the operations of the Racing Point team, which is a race-winning outfit. They did do a good job in 2020. But essentially, it is a new entry. It's In some ways, it's a new team. So they are going to be starting off on the back foot somewhat. And the team does know what they're doing. There is a carryover of the owners, uh, Lawrence Stroll, there's a carryover of the mechanics. But getting to grips with a new car, it's not just a simple case of this, that, and the other, and then it's good. They've got to properly put in all of the work for it. And like I said with Aston Martin, lots of people were expecting them to be good straight away, even possibly challenging the likes of McLaren, Ferrari, maybe even Red Bull and Mercedes. But like I said, that sort of thing's not going to happen overnight. So people, I think, just need to be a bit patient with Aston Martin. Will mentioned earlier, he made the prediction of them possibly fighting for the championship in uh, 22 or 23. I disagree that it will be as early as that, but I'm not discounting the possibility that Aston Martin will fight for the championship at some point in the next Mm. few years, maybe 26, 27, 28, maybe not even until the 30s. We just don't know for certain. But one thing that I do think people need to be... um, aware of with Aston Martin is that success is not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen automatically just because it's an Aston Martin. People need to be patient with them. Yeah, I, I think essentially there's a, there's a danger, isn't there, that people are going to consider that because it's Aston Martin, they'll win straight away. But look, we've had three massive manufacturers come into Formula One in the last 20 years and they've all failed to win a world title. Two out of three of them failed to win a Grand Prix. You had Jaguar, you had Toyota and you had BMW. And the problem is when a car manufacturer gets involved as a formal entry into Formula One, it's very, very difficult for them to think like a Formula One team. You know, these car manufacturers, they plan everything in the boardroom. You can't win a Formula One race in a boardroom. You really can't. And we saw that with Toyota. How many millions of money was squandered and wasted trying to get Toyota to win a Formula One race from 2001 to 2009? You know, they spent a decade and didn't win a thing. Uh, Jaguar, they spent five years, didn't win a thing. BMW, they won once in four years. And if they had actually thought about it like a Formula One team rather than a boardroom, they probably would have developed the car in 2008 and Robert Kubica would be a world champion by now. But, you know, Aston Martin, there is a danger. There is a risk that they're going to do the same thing. You know, too much of the hierarchy at Aston Martin might want a a turn at the reins of the Formula One team. So my hope is that Lawrence Stroll is going to be the titanic totalitarian dictator in that team that he needs to step up and be and say, well, no, we need to run this like a Formula One team. We can't run this like a car company. Yes, obviously, we have the Aston Martin branding and that's valuable, but we've got to run this like an F1 team. We can't run this in the boardroom because we've seen three massive examples of how it has failed. We need to win it like a Formula One team. That's how we need to operate. And that that, that right there is the difference between Aston Martin and Racing Point. Yeah. Aston Martin, as you say, they're thinking a bit more from the boardroom, whereas Racing Point, it was an independent team, privateer team. They were thinking like a Formula One team. And what happened? They won a Grand Prix. 
they did the job right. Because yeah. as you said, Jake, they were thinking like a Formula One team. I completely agree with you that Aston Martin needs to do the same thing. It's worth pointing out, they also won that Grand Prix in two and a half seasons. Yes, absolutely. That's incredible. And bear in mind, when Racing Point first came into existence, after they took over Force India... Look what happened at their very first race in the Belgian Grand Prix. Yeah, they nearly got the lead. (laughs) Esteban Ocon puts it third on the grid. Perez was fourth that day. They locked out the second row. And they could have uh, led the race into Lee Kuma on the first lap. Yeah. And a a bit of a fun fact as well. I was actually at that Grand Prix. So, uh, yeah, Uh just a a bit of a a subtle flex. But uh, nonetheless, you take a look at Aston Martin. And realistically, the good thing, the what's the word? The advantage they have over the likes of Toyota, BMW, and Jaguar. Jaguar, there was a massive disconnect, like you said. They were run like a car company. The famous story of the, someone in the Ford Motor Company saying, who is this Edmund Irvine we're paying millions of dollars to? I'm not sure if that's actually actually true, but it wouldn't honestly surprise me. BMW wanted to buy Williams. Williams told them to go away, so they went away to Sauber. And then, obviously, Toyota had to do everything in the Toyota way. The good thing that Aston Martin have is if the owner of the Racing Point team and the owner of Aston Martin want to make a business deal, all they have to do is look in the mirror. They're both owned by Lawrence Stroll, meaning Mm. that if there is some form of, oh, we need this bit of sponsorship or we need to do this, they can just go to Lawrence Stroll saying, what does Aston Martin say? What does the team say? And he can just say yes, yes, no, no. Or if he has a split personality disorder, for example, he could be justifying it in his own head. I'm not really sure. But... One thing, in my opinion, though, uh, Tova, is Aston Martin need to do what Alpine do. And Fernando Alonso has been very vocal about this. January 1st, put all of your wind tunnel development into the 2022 car. Do you agree with that? Um, I think it's very clear already that the 2021 season, for the title anyway, is going to be a straight fight between Mercedes and Red Bull. We might have the occasional moment of brilliance from the likes of McLaren, maybe Ferrari if they can get their act together a bit, which to me it appears they are doing. They are in the process of getting back up there. So I think any of the lower teams, anyone from the midfield to the back, I think they would be wise in putting their development tokens more into 22 than 21. Uh, The Haas team, that's what they've done. They've already said they brought, I think it's just one upgrade to Bahrain to start the season, but then that's it. That is their car for the rest of the season. They're putting all of their efforts into 22. Whether that pays off or not, that's another matter. But any of the other teams on the grid, I think they possibly need to be looking into doing the same idea. Aston Martin, I think they could benefit from that because it wouldn't only help their progress going into 2022, but it would also give them the time to maybe get their head in the game a bit more. As uh, Jake was saying, there seems to be that element of they're thinking more like a car company than they are a Formula One team. So if they have that season in 2021 where they learn the ropes a bit, they learn how Formula One works, then maybe they can start to think like a Formula One team a bit more, which could in turn be advantageous going into 2022. Alpine could also go down the same route, put all their efforts into 2022. I think Alonso does want to do that. The reason why he came back into Formula One is because he wants to sample the 22 machinery, but then have 21 as a year to get reacquainted with a sport. So I think he's doing the right thing there and saying we should probably look a bit more into spending our development tokens in 22 instead. And there's no guarantee at this stage whether it will be successful or not. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're going to have seven or eight teams that are doing that, they might all develop the car. But at the end of the day, there can still only be one winner. Only one team will be better than all of the others. So it's a bit of a fine balance to find because you've got the cars at the front who are still fighting for this year's championship to then get the prize money that they can take into 2022. But then you've got the people who are a bit more forward thinking of, let's just ditch this season, look ahead to the future, look ahead to the regulation changes and how we can best uh, make the most of these new rules. It's a very fine line to find. And I think if you are looking a bit more into it now and Not quite writing off your 21 season, but just thinking more into the future of how can we make this a better project further on down the line in the long term. I think that's going to stand them in better stead. Now, Jake, you've seen numerous regulation changes in your time, uh, 2009, 2014. Back in the 19, I think it was 1997, a regulation change came around. Either way, what do you think is the game plan? What have you seen which is the best way to go about this? 
It's a difficult one because ultimately this whole aero rake for 2021 has certainly made things a little bit more even. Um, and certainly Toto Wolf has been uh, touted as saying, you know, clearly the regulations have been designed for this year to mix up the grid. And most people are basically looking at that going, good, you know, fantastic, brilliant racing for us. Um, it's difficult, you know. I mean, we, we've got to a stage where with this hybrid car, you know, everything has been down to the technology and it's been difficult to have a symbiotic relationship between aerodynamics and the hybrid tech. Uh, it was a lot easier back in the day when we were looking at internal combustion because the expertise of the grid had been internal combustion ever since 1950. So we've gone with a complete rewrite of how Formula One operates since 2014. And it has been difficult to adapt in it. And the car companies that have already been working with those technologies had an advantage. Mercedes had an advantage over Renault, Honda, and Ferrari. They just did. Uh, Honda probably was the second best in terms of the manufacturers that had uh, any form of hybrid technology. The problem is they weren't in it right from the start, so they were always on the back foot. Uh, so it's difficult. I mean, w- w- obviously, the ultimate end game has to be that the racing's got to be more competitive. If there was no DRS, we would not have seen as many overtaking moves in the last few years as we could have done. And that's because of the problem with dirty air. I think it comes down to the difficulty essentially with bringing the new regulations in through COVID-19 last year, we got delayed. So this year we would have the cars that are apparently going to be much better to run in dirty air. So I think, again, people need to be tolerant of this season. They need to just wait it out and see what happens with 2022. If 2022's regulations don't work, then we have a problem. I think there's still a little bit of waiting time to come for those uh, who are not convinced by it. But, you know, the people that are involved in making these regulations work are people like Ross Braun and Rob Smedley, who are actually, you know, geniuses in their field who know how a Formula One car works, know it inside and out and know how the science of it is going to operate. With those things taken into account, I think we can all be very, very excited about what 2022 is going to bring. But we have to stay loyal to the sport in that time. We have to remember that, yes, Formula One is fickle. It does take time. And also to remember that, you know, the best teams with the biggest budgets will always be the ones ahead. You can't expect Haas to win every Grand Prix. You know, underdogs only triumph under certain circumstances. And Racing Point needed all the decks of the cards to fall in the right way for them to get the win in Sakir. But they still deserved it. So you, you, there are so many different balancing acts, but ultimately the future does look bright. It does look rosy. You can see the big development shift that McLaren and Ferrari have made, for example. There is change coming. It is going to take some time, but the future does look rosy. And uh, just a, a bit of a um, a pause from the uh, the discussion of modern Formula One. Just a new, a little segment I wanted to introduce. I've taken a uh, a leaf out of your book, Jake. I like your segments and your other podcasts. On this day mm-hmm. in Formula One, did you know that Michael Schumacher and Rolf Schumacher made history by becoming the first ever siblings to lock out a front row? Can you tell me what year and what track? Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I think it was 2001. Um, okay, it's been saying 2001. Oh, it's early March, so it's got to be Brazil. I was thinking maybe San Marino. Ah, possibly. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to go ahead and say Imola 2001, but that is with a slight air of hesitancy. Am I allowed to change my answer, Will? You can. Uh, I've, I've locked in Topher's <laughs> answer. Your answer is free to go. <laughs> Malaysia. Ooh. Well, the good thing is, Jake, is you're actually wrong. And so is Topher. It was ah. indeed Brazil, 2001. Oh, no. I was right the first time. Oh, At least last. I got the year right. So I'm claiming half a point. Yeah, for yeah, that you one. can claim half a point for that. I can't believe I changed my answer. That's rotten. <laughs> <laughs> what I'll do is I'll, I'll buy a whiteboard and I'll, I'll start like a tally chart. Like whoever, anyone who comes on the podcast will make a championship at the end of this year. Whoever wins gets a Cadbury's chocolate bar or something. I'll get to, I'll get to be as nerdy as David Addison one of these days. I will. I will. So, Technically, I'm leading the championship with half a point. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, you are, yes. We should, uh, we should call you You Nicky are Nicky Louder, Louder in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Anyway, back to the serious stuff. Yes, Speaking of seriousness. Alpine and Fernando Alonso, Jake, has Alonso made the right choice in coming back, or did a sandwich wrapper get in his way of that? No. 
I'm sorry. I, 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 I genuinely feel this is a waste of a seat. Uh, I like Fernando. I think he brings a great amount of credence and reputation to the sport, but he's on borrowed time. Uh, there's only ever been one driver in the history of the sport to have left for a decent chunk of time, come back and made a success of it. And that is Nicky Lauda, who was one of a kind, literally one of a kind. That will never be repeated in quite the same way. Nicky was born to be uh, living on the edge, on the limit as a racing driver. I mean, I know you could probably say that about Fernando Alonso as well, but I just don't think Fernando's made a sensible decision. Formula One has changed a lot in the 30, 40 years since Lauda's comeback. And it's just a completely different sport now. It has completely evolved even in the three years he's been gone. So I genuinely can't see this as a sensible decision. I think he's wasting his time. I think he's ultimately made a decision that he's going to regret because it's going to bruise his ego. Uh, And I think the Alpine team are going to regret it because, again, they could have gone for someone a fraction of the price and done exactly the same job. Uh, the, the, The thing is, so many of these teams rely upon a name. I mean, Renault, they changed their name for this year to Alpine essentially because the Renault F1 team was affecting Renault road car sales. They weren't having the results that they wanted. There was an unreliability issue and they genuinely felt, well, this is actually causing a bit of an issue for us in the boardroom. So if we rename it to something that is affiliated, but is not directly associated, then we have a chance of increasing the Renault car brand again. And that's why they've done it essentially. So Alpine is there as their luxury brand in the same way that AMG is the luxury brand of Mercedes. And they've basically decided to go down a route of, well, if we cover up our failings by slapping a new name on the team, bringing in a two times world champion, everything will be okay. And that fundamentally isn't going to be the case. I still don't quite understand what Esteban Ocon is doing in the car. I don't really rate him. It's a shame, but I don't think he's the right direction. He has got tenacity when the car is working well, but when the car isn't working well, I just don't think he has the core strength to make it operate. And that's what you need. You need a driver who can develop a car and uh, get round its failings. I think they should have gone for Pierre Gasly, in all honesty. I think commercially he was the better decision. I think maturity-wise he was the better decision. And he could have brought more to the brand. So this is going to be a disappointing, embarrassing, depressing season for Alpine. And I just hope it's not going to be their last year. Because it could well be. I think this is going to be a little bit of a make or break season for Esteban Ocon personally. Mm. Because he's up against a two time legend, that is Fernando Alonso, in the same car. And if Ocon does, as some people are expecting, get trounced by Alonso over the course of the season, that's not really going to do his reputation any good. And a lot, no. um, Ocon might well be out of a seat at the end of, of the season if that happens. And I agree with you, Jake. I think that if Ocon does lose that seat, I think it'll be Pierre Gasly that goes to Alpine and leaves the uh, Red Bull family. Mm. But on the flip side, on the other side of the the coin, if Esteban Ocon beats Alonso over the course of the season and shows everyone just how good a driver he is, and don't forget, this is a guy that won the GP3 series, which you don't do by accident. You've got to be a good driver to win in GP3. And... If he does beat Alonso over the course of the season, that's just going to cement his reputation as a bright young star. And that might even lead him to get back in the good books with Mercedes. Because don't forget, a few years ago, Ocon was the next in line for a Mercedes seat. It's very clearly George Russell now. He's very clearly the next in line. But imagine a scenario where Esteban Ocon beats a two-time legend in Fernando Alonso in the same car. People might start to look upon him a bit more favorably. Now, this is an interesting point i've suddenly worked out we've started talking about aston martin and alpine as a team but the close nature of mercedes and red bull and the resurgence of mclaren and ferrari is actually going to cause a massive problem for any team that isn't one of those four because look, there are only 10 point scoring opportunities in a formula one race that's eight cars already accounted for Now, if they're going to continue to be as strong, as competitive as we genuinely think they are, that means realistically there are only two, maybe three or four at the most point scoring opportunities for any other team. This is going to be a brutal year for the fight for fifth position in the Constructors' Championship, ultimately, because you're going to have 
Alpha Tori, who looks strong, Aston, Alpine, Alpha, and Williams, who all look relatively similar in terms of raw one lap pace, and Haas, who are going to be on the back foot every time. There could be only a handful of points scored in the Constructors' Championship by the likes of Aston Martin and Alpine. So this could be a very brutal year for all of them. And with that in mind, Alpine needed to make a long-term decision that was sensible. And I can't see in any scenario spending a ludicrous amount of money on a two-time world champion that's been out of the sport for two years as a logical choice. So just going back to the um, original question of Fernando Alonso, as we have done, Mm. I can get his thinking behind wanting to come back. I can understand that. He said himself he's aiming more at 2022 when we have the regulation changes where it might turn in their favours. I can understand that thinking behind Fernando Alonso. But if I was him, if I was Fernando Alonso, I actually would have gone over to IndyCar for a simple reason that he is in a very strong position to get the triple crown, which only one person has ever achieved Mm. in their career. And J. Corwill, do you know who that one person is? It's Graham Hill. It is Graham Hill. The only person to have won the triple crown, which is the Monaco Grand Prix, the Indy 500, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Alonso's already won Monaco, and he's won Le Mans. He's had a couple of goes at the Indy 500. Could have won it on his first time out, actually, with the McLaren project. He had a tremendous run of that race. Um, yeah, we won't mention the uh, the Honda engine that was around at that time. But um, I feel as though that if he had gone over to IndyCar on a more full-time basis, he could have spent the first part of the IndyCar season getting acquainted with the series again, getting comfortable in the car, comfortable with how IndyCar works. And then when it comes to that point in the season in the month of May, when they go to Indianapolis and drive the greatest spectacle of, in all of motor racing, I feel so he would have been in an even better position to win the Indy 500. And if he had gone and gone a job done, just if, that would truly cement his status as one of the all-time greats, not just of Formula One, but of motorsport. Only the second person in history to achieve the triple crown of motorsport. Is that maybe a better legacy than coming back to Formula One and getting a third title? If it was me, like I said, I would have gone after the triple crown. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, in all honesty, Topher, I'm surprised you didn't um, say that Formula E would be somewhere where Alonso could go because that would bring amazing commercial opportunities for that sport. Obviously, it is a place. It's a place where they are trying to get more and more drivers who have the biggest star opportunity in racing um, to try and boost the the fan base even more than it's already growing. Anyway, this is a this is a Formula One podcast. We can talk about things like this in 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 other podcasts. But I think I wrote about this in uh, in the race debrief I did uh, for for Downforce uh, UK. Yuki Sonoda. Everyone voted Sergio Perez as the driver of the day, but Yuki Sonoda, an absolutely fantastic debut, Jake, for Yuki Sonoda, the first ever Japanese driver to score points on their debut, the first driver to score points, I believe, since Kamui Kobayashi in 2012, I believe it would have been, if I'm not mistaken. It's about right. Yeah, absolutely. And to be fair to Yuki Sonoda, you know, he was the highest Formula One driver on the grid who wasn't driving a Mercedes, a Red Bull, a McLaren, or a Ferrari. I mean, that's very impressive when you can, we, we consider those are the big four teams. For the guy to be ahead of everybody else, to be a rookie, you know, it shows that people who were doubting whether Yuki was a good choice for Alfa Tori, of which I was originally one of them, uh, have now got to eat their words. You know, he did a fantastic job in Bahrain. He had a difficult opening lap, but he stayed in the game. You know, he lost a few places, but he kept his car in one piece. He didn't pick up damage. He was very sensible. He was very mature. And he figured out where his difficulties on the opening lap could be regained later. And he was so brilliant at maximizing every opportunity. And he just went for every overtake uh, as if uh, the drivers were standing still. You know, he had a real gumption and a real determination, which we haven't really seen since Takuma Sato in the Super Aguri days. So it was really nice to see that, you know, Yuki was coming out of the blocks with something to prove. I think he had seen, obviously, the likes of Buemi, Vern, Algaswari, uh, Gasly to a certain extent, Kvyat, Alban, all coming into the sport and being picked up, chewed up and spat out. That he really wanted to prove that he had a right to be there. He wanted to prove, you know, I'm not just here because I'm Japanese and Honda like me. I'm not just here because I'm part of the AlphaTauri 
uh, stable, the Red Bull stable. I have a right to be here. And that was a brilliant drive from a rookie under the circumstances. Okay, he didn't score a podium on his debut, but again, everything in context. He did a brilliant job given what he was uh, able to do and the equipment that he was handed. He did a sensational job. Really good rookie drive. And uh, one thing about Yuki Tsunoda, um, I'd actually like to liken him to the uh, career progression of Charles Leclerc. See, if you remember back to his junior yeah. Formula days, he won the GP3 series at his first attempt. He won Formula 2 at his first attempt, had a stellar debut season with Sauber, and then went to Ferrari and became a race winner in only his second year of Formula 1. Now, I'm not going to say that Yuki Tsunoda is going to win races in 2022. I mean, he, he could, he could, but I'm not saying that he will. But bear in mind, back in 2018, Sonoda was in Formula 4 as recently as 2018. He went from Formula 4 straight into Formula 3, then Formula 2, then Formula 1, all in consecutive years. Uh, he didn't win the championship in uh, Formula 3 or Formula 2. In Formula 2, I think he finished vice champion, if I remember correctly. But he's still shown that he had that similar career progression to someone who is considered a superstar within Formula 1. And I think that Red Bull and Alpha Tari have got another superstar in their hands in Yuki Tsunoda. A lot of people thinking, well, he didn't win championships coming up through the ranks, and yet he's still in Formula One. Does he really have it? Well, look at what he did in the Bahrain Grand Prix, yeah. as Jake described. Has he got it? Absolutely, he's got it. I uh, reckon, and well, you know, I'm becoming a little bit known for my bold predictions now. Yuki Tsunoda will become Japan's first Grand Prix winner. That's my prediction for him. Now, here's an interesting question. If Verstappen does go to Mercedes in 2022, as some people think, do Red Bull replace him with Tsunoda? Do they leapfrog him <sighs> ahead of the likes of Gasly and uh, possibly Albon as a return? Is Tsunoda now their new choice, potentially? You, you just never know with Red Bull, do you? I mean, bear in mind back in 2016, when Red Bull demoted Danny Kvyat down to Toro Rosso, one race after Kvyat got on the podium. I mean, Kvyat, like, he had the one bad opening race in um, Sochi when he crashed into Vettel. Like, yeah, that didn't look good on Kvyat. But in the race before that in China, he finished on the podium. He did, yeah. And I believe that Kvyat was actually set for a really strong season. And that car was a proven race winner. Mm. If Verstappen won a race, Ricardo won one or two races that year. I reckon if they kept the faith in Danny Kvyat, he possibly could have won a race or two for himself that season. Yeah, it's yeah. so cutthroat is the nature of Red Bull that they took that immediate uh, draconian decision of let's kick him down to Toro Rosso and bring in Max Verstappen. Now, in that particular instance, obviously Max Verstappen was a future superstar. No one was denying that. And in hindsight, it was definitely the right choice of Red Bull to make as they've now got a 10-time Grand Prix winner and someone who is now fighting for a championship. But it just shows that you never really know with the Red Bull Junior program, with their way of bringing drivers into Alpha Terry and into the main Red Bull team. Kvyat looked like he had a lot of potential and could have won races, but then they kicked him out. They brought Pierre Gasly in. He had a lot of potential and showed how good he was in the Toro Rosso days, but then he had a poor couple of years with Red Bull. In the case of Yuki Tsunoda... I reckon he has got the chance to make a really good career out of this and go on to win races, maybe a championship if he gets a good car underneath him. But you just never know with the Red Bull family. They could promote him up to Red Bull for next season, but then if he has a little bit of a poor season alongside Verstappen, if he stays, or let's say along Perez if they keep him on, or if they bring back Albon or whoever, you just don't really know. I'd like to think they would treat him right. He's definitely one of the best drivers they've brought up through their ranks in recent years. Uh, it's so difficult to know what, what Red Bull are going to do with their drivers. We all thought that Pierre Gasly would do a good job with Red Bull. He ended up getting promoted back down to Toro Rosso. Same with Alex Albon. Everyone thought that he'd do a good job. Could have won a race or two, but ultimately he was demoted again as well. It's You just don't really know with Yuki Snyder. I feel as though he does definitely have the potential to go on and have a successful career but at the end of the day, it's down to what Red Bull decide to do with their drivers and how cutthroat they're going to be. Yeah, no, I think I, uh, I completely echo your statements in terms of Yuki Tsunoda, a fantastic talent, but Red Bull cannot make the same mistake that they've made with almost every single driver that has come through their junior program, bar maybe three or four, possibly five, if you're taking a look at other drivers who've gone to other series. But the other two rookies, Topher, Really didn't have a good day in the office. Mazepin 
didn't even make three corners and, and ended it ended his race in the wall. Mick Schumacher spun on the lap um, preceding the uh, the safety car right after it came out. Turn four, he spun. The balance of that car is massively off. There's two rookies. It's it's just going to be a tough season for them, isn't it? I know we knew that this was going to be a difficult year for the Haas Formula One team, but I think Bahrain really just compounded the struggles that they're going to see this year. And uh, bear in mind that Mazepin also span uh, twice over the course of the weekend. Uh, he span in qualifying as well, which ruined the laps of quite a few people. But um, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly what's going on with Haas. I mean, we've already said that they're focusing a bit more on 22. And is that at the expense of a car that is drivable, maybe? Mm. Uh, Mazepin, he had his spin on uh, turn three of lap one, which um, given his uh, reputation, let's say a lot of people were... Uh, what's the word? Um, a lot of people were ripping into him for that. It doesn't help, does it? It, it really doesn't, doesn't help at help. all. But the fact that Mick Schumacher then went and spanned it himself only a few laps later makes yeah. me think that maybe it wasn't just a simple case of Mazepin arguably not being good enough. I'm not saying that he isn't good enough, just arguably. Mm. If Mick Schumacher, who is very highly rated, then goes and does a similar mistake in the same car... Is that more down to the drivers or is that more down to the car? I think that's the question they've got to ask mm. themselves here. I, I think you, you've made a good point, interestingly, because, you know, if it had just been Mazepin, I think everybody would have looked at it to say, well, that proves that then. But the jury's still out, isn't it? Because Mick Schumacher, we all consider to be an incredibly talented driver. I mean, Yuki Tsunoda, who was third in last year's points in Formula 2, he bagged a ninth place finish in the points. And Mick Schumacher, who won the title in Formula 2 last year, couldn't even get the car around on the first racing lap on cold tyres, keeping it in the right direction. So it's difficult to justify, you know, that this is purely down to Mazepin. I think this is wholly down to Haas. The difficulty is, is that they've clearly decided that sponsorship money is what's going to keep them alive. They've made a lot of commercial decisions based on the longevity of the team, not really focused on the car and tried to build this all up for 2022. But Formula One is such a fickle business that there might not even be Gene Haas in Formula One by then. He may just get fed up of looking at the way things are going, dragging the team through the mire, and he may just sell the team to the Russians uh, at SMP Racing. We may well see uh, Mazepin and Schwartzman in the car next year under new management. It's genuinely possible. It's very possible. It could maybe be a sale to uh, Dimitri Mazepin, Nikita's father. He's currently yeah. the uh, title sponsor of the team with Ural Kali. And um, yeah, Mazepin's been getting a lot of flack for obvious reasons that we won't really discuss in any detail. But um, after the uh, the incident that he had, he did come out and apologise and say that he's going to try and do better. Yeah. T- take that however way you will. Some people are saying that, oh, he's just saying that. Me personally, I'd like to actually give him the chance. I'm not at all condoning what he did. I think he was completely in the wrong for what he did in the incident. But he has made the apology. He has said he's going to do better. Where do you think he's not serious about that? That's for you to decide. But I'm thinking, let's actually give him a chance to do it. If we're in the same position this time next year, where he's still a little bit of an idiot, to uh, put it quite lightly, then maybe we can start saying, like, does he have the right attitude for the sport? But uh, personally, I'm getting a little bit fed up of all the hate. That's not just directed at him, but also directed at the team. I've seen a lot on Twitter and on Facebook any time that the Haas social media person puts out a post. It doesn't matter what it's about. It could be about Nikita. It could be about Mick. It could be, oh, here's a behind-the-scenes shot of our mechanics or whatever. There's always going to be someone who will comment, hashtag we say no to Mazepin or something like words to that effect. Yeah, even more derogatory. I mean, let's be fair, the most undesirable job in Formula One right now is the social media guy at Haas. It is the most undesirable job yeah, in absolutely. the Absolutely. And to be quite honest, what's it to do with him? What yeah. is it to do with a social media person? Nothing. It's got nothing to do with them. So all of these people who are putting out on Twitter, hashtag we say no to Mazepin, aiming it to the guy who runs the social media... He, he's got nothing to do with it. He doesn't decide on who the drivers in the car are going to be. That's down to the management of the team. And yeah. it is not the management of the team who are running social media accounts. Yeah, exactly. 
there are some people who will think, well, it's the only way we can convey any sort of message. But at the end of the day, it's a bit of a cul-de-sac they're going down with that route because the managements aren't the ones who are going to be looking at the social media. And as long as uh, Nikita and his father are bringing money into that team, he will still be in the car. And if they do end up selling to the Russians, as you said, Jake, maybe he's in the team for the long term. We could end up seeing another Stroll situation where Lawrence Stroll buys out the team and gives his son a permanent seat. I just feel as though that with Nikita, I'm not condoning what he did at all. It was absolutely wrong what he did. But I feel as though we need to at least try and move on from it. If you still have problems with him, that's up to you. But at least give him a chance, I think. And now that we've talked about all of the drivers and all of the events that happen, well, I say all of the events, uh, Byron Grand Prix was so eventful that um, we can't really cover everything in terms of uh, all of it. But nonetheless... The next race, the Made in Italy Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. That is quite a mouthful to say the least. Jake, try saying it's your... an Italian. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I got a C in French, so I doubt I'll even be able to, um, to do that well. <laughs> before, in before, before we even talk about um, the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix, there's the team. It's quite funny because they are the team that's very easy to forget, and we actually did forget them. And it's Alfa Romeo. We didn't mention them because they didn't do anything over the course of the Grand Prix. And the same with Williams. They didn't really do anything, did they? Neither team really showed up, in all honesty. And it's a shame because like Giovinazzi qualified 12th and Raikkonen qualified 14th. So there might have been something, but they just disappeared and faded, as did Williams, which is unfortunate because both teams are obviously there to play ball, and they didn't really play ball at all. I kind of get the impression from both of those teams that their qualifying pace is a lot better than their race pace. Yeah. Because as you said, Jake, Giovinazzi, for example, he qualified in 12th. That's a great effort from an Alfa Romeo because this was a team that last season and season before were fighting to get out of Q1. So for him to qualify 12th on the grid, that's a really good achievement for Alfa Romeo and for Giovinazzi himself. But then, as you said in the race, Jake, what what happened with them? I, I, I don't know. I hardly saw them in the race. I can tell you. They literally were just conspicuous by their absence. So I'm kind of hoping there's more to come from both teams. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think realistically, you take a look at last year and the year before, and it was almost the Carlos Sainz curse in terms of he was never on TV. Yeah. You look at this year, I think that's going to be the same for Alfa Romeo and Williams, unless they cause a great huge pile up at turn one, to be honest. I think realistically, both teams are in the... Um, yeah. The, the nothing zone, that they can't approach the uh, the top guys, but they're nowhere near Haas, so they're just sort of there. Very true. But uh, yes, anyway, so Jake, your predictions for the Made in Italy Emilia Romagna Grand Prix? I think it's going to be a Verstappen win this time. I just have a feeling that the Red Bull's going to be a little bit stronger than the Mercedes uh, at Imola. So I think we're going to get the title off to a, a really good start with Verstappen getting one over on Hamilton. They'll be one and two. Dare I say Ferrari on the podium? I think maybe there's a good chance of it this time. Charles Leclerc is a very good driver out of the blocks. So it's going to be a really interesting charge back for him. Uh, McLaren will probably be about fourth and fifth again. There might be a point for Alfa Romeo if they can get their act together. It's genuinely going to be interesting, but I think Verstappen might just have this one over Hamilton this time. Uh, you, You just don't know. (laughs) <laughs> do you? I it's mean, brilliant not knowing, isn't it? It's brilliant it, not knowing. Take a look at the Bahrain Grand Prix. Verstappen was the dominant force in practice, in qualifying, but then he didn't win the race. It didn't happen for him. Mm. And I think the sensible choice is probably Verstappen again, but <laughs> you just don't know, do you? And also, this is a track that the drive uh, teams and drivers aren't overly familiar with. I mean, we went there last season as one of the replacement tracks but when was the last time that we were at Imla before that it was um like 2005 2006 sort of mid-naughty sort of times mm, 2006 yeah yeah it's 2006 so the teams and drivers don't necessarily have the familiarity they obviously have the data from 2020 but then what about the new drivers that's coming through someone like Yuki Sonoda for example I don't think he's ever driven this track um it's it's just so difficult to know what's going to happen um I th- I think I should probably uh, hedge my bets a little bit and go on the safe bet. Um, like Jake said, I think maybe Verstappen's going to win it this time. No guarantee that he will. And um, if uh, if Ferrari does get on the podium, I'd, I'd actually quite like to see it be Carlos Sainz. Uh, just for a simple reason that he's a new Ferrari driver. He's pr- a proven podium setter. He's got a few podiums already in his career. 
imagine if he goes and gets his first Ferrari podium in Italy. How great is that going to be for the Tifosi? Mm. That would certainly be fantastic. And a bit of a, a fun fact, I think actually the most, probably one of the most knowledgeable drivers of this circuit is actually Yuki Tsunoda, because that's where he's been doing all his Alpha Tauri testing in the 2018 oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I completely forgot about that. Yes, he has been testing around there. That completely there you go, blew then. my mind. Okay, well, look, that, that's the argument's out the window then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, in all honesty, um, I think I might have to disagree with you two on that fact. Although I would really want to see a Verstappen win to equal up the championship, I think Hamilton and Mercedes will have the uh, the advantage around this circuit in mm. terms of one of the only overtaking spots on the circuit is down the main straight. And last year, we only saw a tiny little DRS straight. So if Mercedes can get a little bit more power in their engine obviously honda have done major steps in order to advance up the grid in terms of engine power i think it will be very close but hamilton will just edge out verstappen again it's a good point because I, I do think that imola god bless it as a circuit and i do love imola imola is great for formula one but i don't think formula one is great for imola that's the, the interesting argument because the last time as we said we were in uh the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola was 2006 when the cars were shorter, narrower, and there was many more over opportunities for overtaking. And even then it was difficult, but now the cars are considerably longer and a little bit wider. And it's, it, there's not a lot of racetrack left to play with. So any overtaking moves are done when somebody makes a mistake. So it's difficult to justify why we're going back in all honesty. I love it as a circuit. I love it as a place, but this is the argument again. Do we need a Monaco without the barriers? I don't think we do right now. Um, I think that might uh, reiterate the point that qualifying is king in this particular yeah. instance. If we have a circuit with hardly any overtaking opportunities, is it going to be the pole sitter that does a lights to flag victory? And as a track like Imola, if you think back to 2005, we had that immense battle between Fernando Alonso and Michael Schumacher. Everyone called it an immense battle for the lead, but how many overtakes were there between those two? There was none. There was no overtakes, which just backs up the point that if you can get a good position on the grid, pole position, then you're in the best position to win the race. And on yeah. the basis of what we saw in Bahrain, where we had Max Verstappen top of every practice session, uh, top of every qualifying session apart from Q2 and put it on pole. I mean, on that basis, on that form, I'm not really thinking that anyone other than Verstappen is going to potentially win this race. Barring any sort of like pressurized mistake or mechanical issue, I think under normal circumstances, this will be a Verstappen win. Well, we've uh, we've I think we've wrapped up everything there, gentlemen. I think that's been uh, quite a um, a productive podcast in terms of getting all of the stories of uh, the new Formula One season and the Formula One race in Bahrain with some predictions for Imola as well. Thank you uh, both of you very much for joining me. And is there anything else that you would like to add on? I think we're all good and done, dear. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, just want to remind everyone to make sure to follow follow us on all of our social media platforms. Give us a follow on Twitter, Facebook. We've got our own Instagram accounts. So, yeah, just make sure you follow us. We'll keep you up to date with all of the latest Formula One news with more podcasts in the future. Well, I think Tofa has well and truly wrapped up everything there. Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. And Hopefully everyone is enjoying themselves, staying safe, and fingers crossed we'll be able to get through some races soon. But nonetheless, thank you very much for listening. Have a great day and goodbye. Go, go, go! Any time of the